you're good to go. Okay, um, so I'm going to be an opportunity all again this week, this time talking about simulations of quantum systems, which, as it turns out, I do have a little bit of experience with this, so I can give some modern updates on this if, if we're interested on that. But, um, hello? There we go. Okay, so... If you're not familiar with the idea of simulations, uh, I don't know what century you're living in, but suffice to say, it's just you take a physics problem and you put it on a computer. So the basic steps are you have some equation that you use to describe your dynamics and you approximate it to an equation that evolves in time with respect to you know position, momentum, those are the classical choices. And then you discretize the problem, so you cut it into chunks and that means that you can now actually like evaluate it on a computer because computers can't actually do completely continuous uh, solutions. They, they have to, to some degree, discretize things. Um, you wanna do this furthermore with bounded error. So you can technically speaking approximate anything, but you wanna be able to approximate it well enough that you can get um, an answer that agrees with you know nature's answer to within some arbitrary threshold. Of confidence, which is important because that really determines what systems are efficiently simulatable versus ones that are not. So in principle, you could try to put any algorithm onto a classical computer, right? That's what the church Turing thesis tells us, but in actuality, that's not always efficient um, for any, any given system for any given error. So, so that's the limiting factor. Um, so what we care about in quantum physics is normally Schrodinger's equation, and it's not actually inefficient. It's like a, a partial differential equation, but there are similar equations in classical physics from like Newtonian mechanics that we can solve efficiently. So you might, the classical comparison point is uh, the harmonic oscillator. So you might have a simple harmonic oscillator in Newton's equations versus in the Schrodinger equation. In Newton's equations, it's sufficient to solve, and you would imagine it's also true for uh, Schrodinger's equation, and that turns out to be correct. The problem is the scaling, the number of equations that you have to solve. That's really inefficient. So we talked about this before in like the inherent advantage of a quantum computer. So um, we have qubits instead of bits, and the dimension of the space scaled by a qubit um, goes as two to the power n, where n is your number of qubits. So your Hilbert space is growing exponentially, and, and this is gonna quickly outstrip what your classical bits can compute. Uh, the, their space is, is nowhere near as powerful. And, and so whenever you have large numbers of, of qubits or a system that describes a large number of particles, such as in like interacting fermionic systems or the Ising model. So if you're not familiar with the Ising model, it's basically just you have like a crystal structure of some sort. You have a bunch of atoms or particles of some sort in a lattice. And you, you care about like the nearest neighbor interactions to within some threshold. So with classical, it's like first neighbors. And then I think you normally take uh, next nearest neighbors as well for the Ising model. But in, in these cases, you have like a large number of particles. And if they're quantum particles, they're described by qubits. And, and so they are living in your Hilbert space. And then that, that space just quickly gets way too big for a classical particle to deal with. Is the Ising model for uh, crystals or some other kind of lattice? So in general, it's used to describe particles in a lattice, but crystals have a lattice structure to them. That's what makes them crystals. Um, and so the particles like naturally fall into the lattice and makes it makes it a, like a one-to-one -one comparison. The Ising model applies to crystals, but I think in practice, the Ising model can apply to much more and, and it often is used that way. It's, it's a fairly useful Hamiltonian for a lot of systems, but crystals in particular. Okay, so you know we can start looking now at a quantum simulation algorithm, and the first two steps are pretty much the same. So classically, you would start with your dynamics, which is you know um, you have some function that describes the derivative of space and time, and and that comes from uh, f equals ma. 
Okay. Um, so quantum version of that is you have some initial state and then you evolve it based on your Hamiltonian. Um, which, yeah, so ha Hamiltonian evolution looks like, yeah, it looks like this guy, right? Um, for your states, all right? So that's that's the actual continuous function that you have. But then you want to approximate it. And so classically, we do this, you know, the way your calculus teacher taught you how to take a derivative. So you, you take a derivative and you add a little bit, and then that gives you the next value of your function, right? Um, and it's like a first order approximation. Okay. And so if you take the equivalent first order approximation for your Schrodinger equation, you say, okay, I take this like small time step. And um, well, this guy is potentially very intractable to do, you know, exponentiating a Hamiltonian. Um, so, so what does that look like to first order? Well, you know, Taylor expansion. If you, we take the Taylor expansion of this guy, we know that our first term is going to be identity. And we don't want to evolve based on the identity because that's obviously going to give us a steady state. Um, so then we take, you know, our first order correction term which will which will look like this and for convenience sake h bar is equal to one because i'm a theorist and i work in theorist units so so you know at this point in the classical algorithm you can you have discretized the problem into certain time steps and now you can start going but you want to take a little bit more care in the quantum simulation version because oftentimes this level is not going to be sufficient or you have additional complications in actually implementing that Hamiltonian and it, it's still not efficient to put on your quantum computer. So remember when we talked about um, universal gates and breaking those down, even though you can put any unitary gate on a quantum computer, not every unitary gate is efficient to, to implement on a quantum computer. So we want some additional um, structure to our Hamiltonian to make it more uh, conducive to actually putting it on a quantum computer, and that's often referred to as Hamiltonians, uh, the local Hamiltonian problem. So in, in this slide, I use C local, but I think in a later slide, I use K local. That's more common, but I'm going to be honest, I just grabbed a lot of equations straight from Nielsen and Schwong, and, and they labeled this one using K, so you can't call it K local. But the idea is that you have some Hamiltonian that describes your overall system, but you can break it down into a sum of other Hamiltonians, which are not necessarily commuting, but only interact with some finite subsystem of their overall system. And so you can say it's C local if for, you know, all of your particles L, each sub Hamiltonian only affects C particles at one time. So if you think about the Ising model, um, and if you're not familiar, just think about particles in a, on a line, dots on a line, and you say you have a two local Hamiltonian. So let's see if I can draw that out. No, I'm using a laser pointer right now. Okay, hold on a second. Pin. Thank you. Okay, so if you draw that out and you have like a, you know, a bunch of particles on a line, for your Ising model, then um, if you have the Hamiltonian of the Ising model that's describing only nearest neighbors, then this particle only affects in this range, right? So um, there's only three total particles affected. And so you, this is a uh, three local Hamiltonian. Okay. But it, it's not the whole Hamiltonian of the system. It's just the, the local Hamiltonian of each individual particle. And, and so, you know, if you have like an Ising model or a Hubbard model or interacting fermions, you can break it down into this, this sum of local Hamiltonians. And that turns out to be a pretty, a pretty good approximation for a lot of problems that we would be interested in. Not even an approximation, it can be exact. So then we move Given this, we have something of this form, then we can move to uh, the Trotter approximation or the Trotter-Suzuki approximation, depending on how exactly you're implementing it. But it's based off of uh, the Trotter formula. So the Trotter formula is bigger than physics. It's, it's a mathematical formula statement on Hermitian operators that says, as you see here, that if you have, you know, 
one evolution and then another raised to some power and then you take the limit of that, then you, you get something that looks like what you would expect. So what it, what is going on here that deserves to have a theorem, right? Because if you're not familiar with the operator calculus, you might be like, well, that just kind of looks obvious. Well, in general, if A and B don't commute, you can't uh, separate out A and B. That's really what's happening here. This is only true in the limit as n goes to infinity that um, A and B can be combined this way. So in general, going back and forth between A and B added together in the exponents and A and B uh, separated into their own exponentiated term, that's not necessarily true. It's only true in the limit. Um, I don't know if that's clear. And like Zach, feel free to correct me if my language is a little bit off there. That sounds right to me. Okay, cool. So, um, yeah, and then, so you you have this this formula, this Trotter formula, which is um, describing the relationship between exponentiated operators, and then you can take an approximation and say, well, you know, this is true in the limit, but I can say, you know, the sum of operators in the exponent is approximately equal to one evolution and then another, you know, up to some error. And this is an error in uh, delta squared. And you can you can come at um, relationships like this via Baker Campbell Hausdorff and Taylor expansion. And I do have a proof of and a statement of Baker Ham Campbell Hausdorff like waiting in the wings if we're interested in that. But I don't want to drag y'all through a proof. Um, uh, do you have something to say, Zach? Or no, it's just. It can be a long proof. <laughs> it can. It can be. Um, it's a physicist's proof. We'll say that I have, and it's a picture of one. So, well, maybe it won't be long. Then I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, what it? What does this approximation do? Well, if you have, if you can write it in this way, this product way. Ah. Okay. If you write it in this product way, then you can describe it as one unitary evolution and then another, right? Which means, you know, there's a natural way to put it on a quantum computer. And so if you have the statement that your Hamiltonian looks like a sum of k local Hamiltonians, then what you can use the Trotter-Suzuki approximation to say is that the evolution of your Hamiltonian, which is exactly equal to uh, probably shouldn't have used I here. Hold on. Let me find my little eraser. We'll call this J. H. Okay, right. So that's exact. Well, Trotter Suzuki says that this is equal to E I J T uh, for J plus some correction term, order of T squared. Okay, so that, that's the Trotter-Suzuki approximation. And so what this product formula tells you is that you can treat, treat each local Hamiltonian as its own evolution and you can do it in an individual unitary gate and that makes things a lot more feasible for simulating your Hamiltonian. And this is also why it's simulation and not exact because you have this, this error here. Okay. So what does this look like? Well, you have three main portions that you do. So you have an input where you, you have your K local Hamiltonian and you describe its evolution in time, right? And we've described a little bit of how we want that to be formatted. Um, and then you have some initial state that you wanna evolve in time, call it psi naught. And uh, you have some given accuracy and a final time. So basically take this state, evolve it by this Hamiltonian um, and get me at some later time, the correct solution to within some, some accuracy. And the output is obviously some, some guess of your final state and we require it to be within that Delta neighborhood of what you would want the actual natural system to evolve to. So that's just an accuracy statement about like, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect, but it should be good enough, you know, for government work, right? The actual procedure as described in Nelson and Schwong is you just take uh, your initial state and, you know, 
evolve it to the approximate initial state, however that is. This is just initialization, really, state creation. Um, and then you're gonna iteratively update it in this format where, like, as I described here, you know, each one of these is its own individual uh, unitary evolution. And so those are the unitaries that you're doing here. You're doing each individual time step, each individual um, local unitary to your state. And you're gonna do that over and over again in order to build up your time evolution. Um, and that, that's what the loop part says, is just do it over and over again until you've reached your final time. And then at the final time, give me some result. Okay. Uh, this is the example they did in Nielsen and Schwong. So uh, I didn't add any text up here. We could go through this together. So the, the Hamiltonian they give is uh, Z1, tensor Z2, Z3, da, 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 all the way up to Zn, which here is like n is equal to four in this diagram. And then they claim that this simulates the action of that Hamiltonian. And do you believe that? Maybe. Um, not until you show me. Not until you show. I don't know. Okay. Um, all right. So, what does this guy do? This this is your evolution by Z. All right. So, um, we have E, the negative I H bar T, which is just equal to E negative I. Uh, ZT here, basically, and um, you can convince yourself of that because it's just Z all the way down. Um, what do you mean by Z? Like just the ordinary one, zero, zero, minus one matrix? Yeah, so Z is um, Okay. okay, so you're telling me the Hamiltonian is just Z. Well, this oh, is the, like this. a vector of Z's, right? This is this is uh, infold Z's rather, mm. right? Um, but it, what it looks like is, um, okay. So this is a sum of Hamiltonians, correct? Mm -hmm. What this looks like is, um, Z1 tensor. All right. Hold on. Is it, is it a sum? One. It's not a sum. Oh, I mean, yes. it's. Yeah. Okay. Actually, let me rewrite Z. All right. I'm second guessing myself now. I really was hoping we could go through this one together because, like, this part. That's what I'm here for. Thank you. Second guess yourself. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, this part is very confusing for me. Um, because this is a simplified circuit, because the natural way for the for us to do this and is to take e to the i h t, which is just equal to e to the i z1 tensor z2 tensor da 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 z n. Okay. T. You can set t equal to one, but that's pretty trivial. Um, and now we want to break this down. And so we want to say that this is a, a sum of local Hamiltonians. Um, but what is the action of this when we when we try to take um, like if you if you were to look at the Taylor expansion of the, of this guy, right? So it would look like I plus you know the string of Z's I H T da 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 da. da right? That's your first order approximation, correct? Which is just this guy. Well, this guy just acts individually on each system. Do you agree with me there? For some reason, I feel like there's a minus sign on the other slide, but I, plus seems oh, right. Oh yeah, there's, there's minus signs here. Oh, okay, so, that's where it comes from. Yeah, yeah, so you need a minus sign there. Yeah, I set negative one equal to one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. So this is your approximation, right, from earlier on. 
Okay, and now I want this Hamiltonian to be k-local. And, you know, if you're familiar with the action of such a Hamiltonian, then you know that the way that this appears in a circuit diagram is if you, let's say we have four to match up. This is just the Hamiltonian. Sorry, y'all, I'm trying to write on a screen that is tilted up and I'm not very good at it. Take your time. Okay, so this Hamiltonian looks like that, Yes. right? Okay, um, is it clear that this Hamiltonian is a local, is a sum of local Hamiltonians? Yes, because there's one acting here and one acting here. What just happened? <laughs> All right, clear. All right, some technical difficulties, you know, so on and so forth. Um, so this is a sum of local Hamiltonians, all of those Hamiltonians being described by e to the iz. Correct? Uh, say again. Okay, so this Hamiltonian is described by this circuit. Yes. Right? Yes. Um, and this circuit is local, which means that we can describe this total evolution as being equal to a product of e to the negative i z t, where z acts on the j qubit, up to some correction term, hmm. right? I can see from the diagram why that's true. I just, I can't seem to split up that Hamiltonian into parts. Yeah, so I think it's easier to look at this from like a tensor network point of view, where you can slide all of these uh, Z's around. Mm -hmm. And then this is Z1 tensor I3 plus Z, or plus I tensor Z2. My Z and my two looks exactly the same. C2, tensor, I2, so on and so forth. And then you can see that it's a sum. I don't, I don't know. Uh, uh, I don't see a sum there. That's not okay. how tensors work. OK. Uh, so this okay, is a tensor ignore network. Me, ignore me. <laughs> OK. I can come back to this one, because that part I do actually understand but um suffice to say we can get to this point right where we can write it as a product of easy on everything uh, so if if this is true that it's the sum over these local hamiltonians all acting on uh their own qubits then we can describe it the evolution as equal to a product of evolutions yeah, Suzuki, yeah Suzuki. And then this circuit does that. And how does that do that? Well, um, the way that it eff effectively works is, so the idea being that when these are all even parity, so the number of ones and zeros um, are equal. So even parity is like zero. So you add them up like in bi binary. If it's even, you do nothing. And if it's odd parity, so if you add them up in binary and you get one, um, then you flip sign. And so all the, the C notes are doing is it's going, hey, you know, um, if this is one, flip this to one. If this is one, flip this to one, flip, or flip, if this is one, flip this, you know, it's adding up the parity of all of these qubits. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So all this does is add the parity and then it acts on the overall system uh, because, you know, all that'll happen is, is a sign change. And so the argument is here, that this implements the dynamics, but efficiently because it, it simulates the overall dynamics on, on one qubit and there are like finitely many gates here.
Okay. I don't know if that was a particularly helpful example or if it was like a little bit confusing, but um, very just confusing. My, yeah. All right, we can we can talk about this more. Um, and I think was that yeah. I think this is the last slide. So that's what happened. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. so we can talk well, about this more. All right, I don't feel bad about this then. All right. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so the thing you have written to the left uh, with all mm -hmm. the Z's. So, you, you when you sum all these things, all these tensors up, you, you don't get H. But when you take the product of them, you do. So, um, okay. So I'm going to do a little bit of tensor networks real quick. So that network, call it one. Sorry, my dog is like also pulling on my hand and trying to get me to pet her. So, you agree that these are equivalent diagrams? Yes. Okay. Um, and so this is equal to. Z1 tensor identity on the other three qubits. So I'm going to call yes. that I3. Yes, and this absolutely. is equal to I tensor Z2 tensor I2. Yeah, I see, I see where you're going. Um, mm -hmm. So my gripe is um, the, the product of these is the Hamiltonian. I right? see what you're saying. Yeah. So when we're writing things as a sum of locals, you know, we want a sum, right? I, I don't see how to break this into a sum. I don't think there is a way to do it. Yeah, no, when you write this out this way, it is the sum. Like, so this, um, just for clarity of everyone else, because I don't know if they'll keep up with us otherwise. I, I kind of see where you're going with, but um, this is I3 tensor Z1. Um, so this is a sum here. So H is equal to the sum of all of these. I don't think so. Yeah. Um, so let's write it out and double check. I'm actually going to stop writing the subscripts. Well, no, I need them. Never mind. So. Running out of time. Okay, so I want this to be true. Um, okay, and keep in mind they only act on their own. When you add up unitaries, they only act on their own system, right? So. Um, uh -huh they act on the system corresponding to the position of the tensor. So what, what I'm saying is like, you can't add this Z to this Z. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. But you are supposed to add the Z1 with the I and then another I and then another I, which makes something that isn't what you're looking for. Actually, you can't even do that because they're uh, the other components aren't the same. Okay, I think oh, yeah. I think what would help is that you have a test state. Okay. Yeah. Right. Actually, hold on. Let me change this, and I'm gonna hop into OneNote just so I have more room to uh, more room to write. We, we, we could just follow the circuit, see what it does. No. <laughs> it, it's it's easy to exponentiate the Z. It's already diagonal, so. This is true. But um, I, the they use it like a trick to really make it into like the addition of parity. So, um, okay. but um, 
So the problem we had is h on some state psi, and we want to see if that's the same as. Um, let's just do two for now, just so I don't have to write as much. Sure. Okay. This is not plus. This is tensor, and then plus. Okay. This is so. This is h equal to z one tensor z two. Yeah. Plug in zero zero. For psi. I mean, you want to plug in numbers? I don't think we need to. Uh. I think it's going to come up with a counterexample. So, okay. If you do zero zero. So then, each on zero zero. Yeah. That should give you back zero zero. Plus another zero zero. So, wait. Mm. Um, no, no, no. Wait. Hang on. Yeah, should give you two. So that alone doesn't make any sense. Yeah, okay. I, I get what you're saying. There's a problem with normalization. And not only that, this this is not equal to Z1 tensor Z2. It, it's the product that would be equal to that. So I maybe maybe we're not meant to break this into local pieces. I don't know. Yeah, I mean like yeah, they they just kind of it's clear that it acts locally. Right. Uh, yeah, the individual operators are single qubit operators, so they act only on single qubits. Mm -hmm. um, and like, I'm not worried about a normalization factor because we can always stipulate, you know, it's O. Oh, you break it down and it's one half. You know, that's really what the local operations are. They're one half this plus that. Yeah, my, my gripe is just that the sum doesn't come out to the correct thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, so what is that sum? So that would be say one half. Um, whatever, um, and then you get one, zero, 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 minus two on the bottom. Oh, nope, we have one half, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So if you do Z1 tensor Z2, then you definitely don't get that. No, you get, um, This is, this is, hmm, yeah. This is like a, a Z transform on the whole thing, right? Yeah, so I mean, this is just a property of tensors. You, you can't just sum them up uh, mm -hmm. like that. The, the identity is a multiplicative identity. It's not an additive one. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe it's supposed to be uh, something like this, but then it doesn't quite make sense. I mean, yeah, it makes so sense. This is that, true. That would be correct. Um, decomposition is not true. Yeah, so that the same with the multiplication is correct, but it's not what you want. <laughs> uh, well, except for the minus the one half sign, but um, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm just curious what, what this circuit actually does. So maybe we can like take a test state and pass it through it and see what happens. Yeah, so the circuit, just to be clear, and again, I'm just going to draw out two. I can't believe I completely missed that dot. Um, and then something like that. And sure. you have zero yeah. here. Yeah. And then 
is e to the i z e t. Um, Something like that, yeah. Which is equal to um, e to the i t. I think minus. minus. Mm -hmm. At the top should be, oh, you have a minus up there. OK, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then that's equivalent to. Oh, OK. Because we're, we're taking a global phase factor, right? Yeah, global phases don't matter. Fine, I agree. Um, OK, so what is this guy doing? Well, we can figure it out based on what it does to the basis states. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's clear that it never changes your first two qubits. Mm -hmm. It only ever changes your final qubit. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we really only care about the final qubit. So this is... Well, according to the diagram, we always input zero for the bottom one for some reason. Yeah, I think that's your computational qubit. Yeah, that's your ancilla. So then you only have those two left. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so first one, what happens? Uh, you get out zero, zero, zero after the C naughts. And then, uh, yeah, so that's what you get out because zero, zero is a steady state. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. So just to go through it again in detail. Uh, so if the first two qubits are zero, then the C naughts do nothing, right? So these first two gates do nothing, but then we still apply this E to the minus I Z T but that does nothing to the zero state, right? Because the zero state is just the column vector one zero. So the matrix product there is just one zero again. Okay, yeah, I agree. So this one, um, yeah, so this one goes through, um, you flip your computational bit to one. And so it's gonna pick up uh, this and there, you only activate it once with C naught. And so it's going to get the e to the 2i phase factor in front of it. So you... Yeah. OK. And then same thing here, right, for, for similar reasoning. Yeah. And the only other thing to worry about is when it's back to even parity, when you have one and then one. Um, so this goes back to 0. And then you get back one one zero, and that's that makes sense because then you have a global phase on your other two. Mm -hmm. They both flip signs, so you should just pull that out, and then you get back here. Okay. Okay. Um, so does this simulate that Hamiltonian? Yes. Why? So this is this is the circuit. Okay. And then what does the Hamiltonian do? And I think this this third qubit is ancillary. Okay. Mm. So you only care about the first two qubits. And so you can double check. Um, Z tensor Z on zero, zero will give you zero, zero, right? H uh, on zero, you want, one. You want the exponential of the Hamiltonian, right? No. Uh, so when you, when you say you're simulate, simulating a Hamiltonian, what you mean is that you're simulating the exponential of the Hamiltonian, right? Because that's the mm -hmm. thing that propagates the particle. I mean, the first thing I was going to go through is that in general, the way you write psi of t is equal to um, yeah, whatever. Okay, yeah. So um. I, w I was doing the negative psi of zero. This thing. Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. Yeah, so HT, whatever. Um, Minus, yeah, okay, fine. Um, yeah, but uh, that's not, you know, strictly necessary. Okay, so we need to look at what I minus IHT does. Mm -hmm. And then we know I is never going to change anything. Correct? Uh, right, right. Yep. I mean, it, there is there's a difference there, though, so we have to take that into account. Like, mm -hmm. I, I'm saying you can't just throw away the I, right? But yeah, yeah but do, uh, do it. It, it suffices at first to look at the dynamics of each. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so H on zero, zero will give you zero, zero. H on zero, one will give you negative zero, one, correct? Yes. H on one, zero will give you negative one, zero. H on one, one will give you one, one. So then uh, we have I times that, and we have a T. Yeah, so so all of these will then go to, you will have um, one minus I T zero, zero. Um, yes, yeah. One plus I T one zero minus. Okay, so th this is the form uh, if you don't factor out uh, that E to the minus I T in the matrix. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so these are equivalent. Yeah. Basically, you'll get two steady states and then two uh, that evolve in time. Yep, pretty uh, neat, I guess, yeah. All right. Thanks for humoring me. <laughs> Anytime, dear. Um, okay. Let me stop recording.